Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. I am Emma Joyce, Head of Community at Global Digital Finance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this week's Global Leaders Town Hall. This series is in partnership with the Global Blockchain Business Council, and today we are delighted to welcome special guest, SEC Commissioner Hester Pearce. Jeff Bandman, GDF board member, is hosting today's town hall. Jeff is widely recognised as a thought leader, speaker and educator on blockchain and crypto asset law, regulation and policy. He is co-founder and board member of Global Digital Finance and leads our regulatory engagement globally. Jeff was formerly a senior official at the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission, where he was responsible for the design and launch of Lab CFTC, the CFTC's innovation hub and the first established by US market regulator. Commissioner Hester Pierce was appointed by President Trump to the US Securities and Exchange Commission and was sworn in on the 11th of January 2018. Prior to joining the SEC, Commissioner Pierce conducted research on the regulation of financial markets at the Mercator Center at George Mason University. She was a senior counsel on the US Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs, where she advised ranking member Richard Shelby and other members of the committee on securities issues. Commissioner Pierce served as counsel to SEC Commissioner Paul Atkins. She also worked as a staff attorney in the SEC's Division of Investment Management. Commissioner Pierce was an associate at Wilma Cutler and Pickering and clerked for Judge Roger Anderwelt on the Court of Federal Claims. Commissioner Pierce earned her bachelor's degree in economics from Case Western Reserve University and her JD from Yale Law School. We welcome and encourage your questions. If you have a question, please feel free to submit them anytime using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. I hope you enjoy today's session, and I'd now like to welcome Jeff and Commissioner Pierce. Well, uh, welcome and uh, good morning, and thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, we're really uh, thrilled to have you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Jeff, it's great to be here. Um, I, I'm delighted to be able to talk with all of you and, and hear the discussion from the audience as well. Um, I do want to give my standard disclaimer, which is that my views represent my own views and not necessarily those of the Securities and Exchange Commission or my fellow commissioners. Sure, un understood. Thanks for that. Um, so, uh, you know, 2021 is is off to uh, you know a, a quite an eventful start on on so many levels. Uh, you know, related to digital assets, regulation, markets, and and so on. So, hopefully, we'll cover a lot of that. Um, Today, but you know, even when we were arranging uh, this uh, late last year, <laughs> you know, some of these topics were predictable and many were unforeseeable uh, or largely unforeseeable. Um, so let's start with uh, there's a new uh, new SEC chair coming in, uh, Gary, or at least expected to be coming in. Uh, Gary Gensler has uh, been announced as the nominee. Um, he's um, shown considerable interest prior to uh, potentially joining the SEC. Uh, in crypto assets, ICOs, and blockchain. He taught on the subject in NIT. At MIT, he's testified before Congress, even co-authored a, a treatise. So he seems like someone who could certainly hit the ground um, running um, on, on uh, crypto and digital assets. Um, from your perspective, you know, what would you tell him are uh, the most urgent priorities for the agency in, uh, in dealing with uh, the crypto market and digital assets? Sure. Well, I'm looking forward to um, to if he is confirmed to his arrival at the SEC. I think he'll bring with him, as you said, quite a bit of experience in this area and knowledge of this area, which is really positive for a regulator to have. I think it's a it's a good time for us to take a fresh look at what we're doing in this space, um, and and I think he'll be able to do that because he does have that base knowledge um, built up, which is pretty unusual actually for a regulator who also has knowledge, broader knowledge of the markets and uh, and quite a bit of experience as a regulator. So I think this will serve the agency well that he comes with that kind of knowledge. Um, in terms of, of priorities related to crypto, I would say there are several. I mean, the, the overarching theme is we need clarity. Um, and I think that clarity really should come from the commission level. Uh, it certainly is valuable to have staff level no action positions, which is something that we've done some of at the SEC. And I think it will probably be helpful if we do some more of that, but we really need to, to take it up to the commission level and offer clarity on 
how does how how does a project figure out whether its token is a security or not? Um, that's relevant not only to projects but to platforms that might want to trade that that uh, token and to others who might want to interact with that token. And while we at the SEC have a very broad definition of security that is intentionally ambiguous, I would say intent not intentionally ambiguous but intentionally broad, so that it it captures anything that is a security regardless of what it's called. Um, that has, has led to quite a bit of confusion in this space. And I do think we can do something to provide some kind of clarity around that point. Um, a second issue I would say is we need to provide clarity to uh, broker dealers, investment advisors, and other entities that want to interact with crypto. Um, what are the parameters that that allow them to do that, um, and and you know what are they allowed to do and not allowed to do in that space? I think that's very important. And then a third area I would say we're, we'll we'll get, um, and we know we will because we've already gotten some applications in in terms of exchange traded products dealing with crypto. Um, I think we need to provide more clarity around what it is exactly we're looking for. Um, in order to allow one of those things to to go live to, to hit the market, um, right now we have, you know, we, we have issued denials that have sort of a a, a list of issues that um, that we're concerned about. But that list of issues doesn't really seem consistent with the approach we've taken in the past to thinking about exchange traded products. So I hope that we can provide some clarity on on what exactly we're looking for in that space. Sure, just, uh, sure, just uh, sticking with the last uh, you mentioned, uh, the, the exchange traded products, because there's a considerable interest in that. Um, I mean, are there, uh, do you have a sense of what the, the most significant issues are there and have, have the conditions potentially uh, evolved to a point where we could see uh, an ETP, uh, you know, for, for retail investors, for example, approved in, 2021, and you know, is it the is, is it the data and underlying pricing issues, or, is it, or uh, you know, I feel like there's kind of a constant set of the goalposts been moving. Like, how are you thinking about that area? Well, that's how I'm thinking about it too. That the goalposts have been moving. Um, look, when I when I wrote my dissents um, about these these exchange traded product denials, one of the things I said is. I really don't think we're applying the standard that we've applied to similar products in the past. And so we're looking at, we're looking for a level of certainty with regard to the underlying spot markets that I don't think we've demanded in other, in other cases. And we're looking for a degree of surveillance of those markets that I don't think we have demanded in other markets. So I think we have to somehow pivot from that and say, you know, look, market conditions have actually changed quite a bit. We have very established futures markets now. We have widespread institutional interest there and, and involvement. There's there's been much more clarity about which exchanges are um, legitimate. I want to say, in in the sense that the trading that you see is actually um, is actually legitimate trading. So there's much more clarity around that, um, and. There have been enforcement actions, I, I think, which have added a degree of um, uh, credibility to the space as well. Um, so, so I feel like all of those pieces are in place, and you're seeing alternative products now that are not exchange traded, but are the are are the only entry route essentially for retail investors to get a product that is tra that is um, traded in the in the securities markets that has access to Bitcoin. So I think all of those factors can play into it. But, you know, I go back to the statements I made before, which is it does seem that the standards are, are moving constantly, as you said, a, a moving goalpost. And so we're going to have to confront what we did before as we as we look at an approval. And of course, any approval will depend on the facts and circumstances of the particular application. I mean, 
I can't say across the board that any application coming in the door should be approved. It does depend on the, on, on the facts and circumstances. And people have taken different approaches to how they want to build these products. So that's something that we have to look at as well. Sure. And with your, your part of your uh, career in uh, Division of Investment Management, do you feel that gives you, you know, some additional insights into kind of the nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, kind of what has been approved in the past and what some of the gating issues have been? Yeah, well, I mean, it does give me a, a definitely a window into the conservatism with which the division and, you know, look, the, the reasons are good. They want to make sure that um, investors are protected and, and the division of investment management has been really critical in building up um, the mutual fund and exchange traded fund um, industry that has has served so many investors so well. And so I, I'm, I'm cognizant of the role that that division has played in, in that um, space. But I also know that, you know, for example, it took us 25 years to come up for with a rule for extreme exchange traded funds, just <laughs> plain vanilla exchange traded funds. And so we can be a bit slow. Yeah, yeah. My, uh, my, I mean, yeah. there were some intervening events, but still 25 years is a long time. Yeah, I guess by comparison, ten years to to get the the security based swaps rules is is lightning fast, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to defend the agency a bit there because um, so so Jeff's referring to the security based swap rules, which were which were part of the Dodd Frank mandate that we got uh, at the SEC, and and it it did take us quite a long time to get them done, and we're still actually in the process of of um, getting our registration regime up and running. But the SEC did have quite a, a few other mandates in the wake of uh, in the wake of Dodd Frank sure. and no, the sure. Jobs Act. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jobs are very important. Very important. So these, these some of these these issues, you know, kind of the exchange traded products, uh, you know, overall kind of clarity on you know when something is uh, you know is or is not um, a security that you know uh, some of the clarity on. Um, you know, kind of what are the, some of these intermediaries, the broker dealers, investment advisors that, to do? Um, do you have a sense of whether those are potentially, you know, bipartisan issues that, that you'll be able to find uh, common ground? Common or ground. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the really nice things about crypto, which is that it's a new set of issues. And I think people on both sides of the aisle recognize the promise of the technology. And, um, you know, there's skeptics, of course, on both sides of the aisle, too. But I think there is is um, a real uh, joint understanding of the importance of having having rules in place um, that provide more clarity and that allow some of this innovation to happen here in the United States, which is now not happening here in the United States. Um, so I'm I'm optimistic that we can um, come together across partisan divides and 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 uh, and work on this issue together. Yeah. Well, the SEC has such an you know such an important role in in the future evolution of of these current current status as well as future as evolution. well as future evolution. A lot of people would a lot of people would, would love that kind of thing. That kind of thing. I apologize. One other that. issue that I should mention in terms of clarity, and I think this is one that we're going to really be forced to confront, and that's DeFi. Um, so there's a lot of activity. 2020 was a really fruitful year for DeFi in the sense that there was a lot of development going on. Um, the, the, the dollars that are locked up in DeFi are pretty astounding now. Um, and so that's an area that I, you know, some of it really doesn't touch us as at the SEC, but I suspect that some of it probably does. And so we really need to do it a better job um, providing some clarity ahead of time. Um, I mean, I can't really say ahead of time because I guess the, the activity is already happening, but but I don't want to be in a situation where we're bringing a number of enforcement actions down the road um, because we didn't tell people ahead of time, hey, you might want to think about how the SEC's rules um, affect what you're doing. Yeah, the growth of DeFi has been just an incredible story over the, particularly over the the, the second half of uh, 2020 in terms of the, the growth and and the first kind of couple of months of, of of this year. The amounts 
the amount locked, kind of all the, the new the new protocols. And um, yeah, I mean, it seems like even if if the SEC isn't like directly regulating a platform, you know, I think that um, you know, kind of the status, you know, some, some of the other topic you brought up, you know, can have relevance. So, for example, you know, if if you have a platform and you know they're trying to determine whether they can use a stable coin as a means of, of payment on the platform um, you know then kind of the or can they send it to you know security holders you know then that in itself becomes you know even if the core activities fall under one category they may need regulatory clarity on you know kind of whether the, whether the instrument they, they want to use is a means of payment or to accomplish you know, on ledger settlement, <laughs> you know, is, is, is there, um, but, but how, how, I mean, I mean, I think there's actually a lot of, lot of appetite for, um, you know, for, for the SEC to provide more clarity around, you know, when something, you know, is going to be viewed as a security or whether kind of an offering is integrated or viewed as part of a, a, a security offering. But I mean, th there's, um, I, I mean, you know, there, there are so many facts and circumstances and I mean, you know, the SEC, I mean, I mean, I suppose one way to handle it would be for everybody to come in and try to get a no action letter. But I, I mean, you know, just the, the bandwidth to do that, would be, I don't know, like, are there other mechanisms that you've identified for, you know, things the staff can do without sort of opening the door to people abusing and circumventing Howie to, to do this more efficiently? Yeah, I mean, I think your your point is is uh, is a good one that you know no action letters are one way to do things and almost has been the preferred way for the SEC you know saying well yeah come in and tell us about your project and we'll work on a no action letter with you but that process can be really time consuming and I mean from a bandwidth perspective you're absolutely right I'm not sure that that's a a, a great use of our staff's time either. Um, so what I would like us to do is to do something like the safe harbor that I proposed a year ago, which is to say, we're gonna acknowledge the fact that sometimes the line here is fuzzy about what might be a securities offering and what might be just a token sale. Um, and we're going to give you the opportunity to develop your network and sell tokens as you're developing that network, but you got a three year period to do that um, and by the end of that three-year period, it should be clear that the things that are the, the tokens on the network are not securities. Um, but providing some investor, I, I don't even, investor protection is not really the word because in, in my view, these are probably more like customers, but to provide, provide some protection for the purchasers of the tokens um, that would be somewhat like securities, like disclosures, but designed for this for this um, environment where you have maybe different things that you would want that a token purchaser would want to know about. You know, you want to know whether the, the people developing the platform are planning to dump all their tokens at some point down the road. Are they really going to build this platform they're telling you they're going to build? Who is involved in the project? Um, those kinds of things. And then you've got the backup of the anti-fraud laws. Um, the securities laws to say if you lie about this stuff, then we can bring an enforcement action against you. So that's a kind of safe harbor approach that I think might work in this area. Um, it's not designed for someone who's just starting day one from scratch to build something. It really is intended to be for projects that are fairly far along and that they're ready to do their token distribution event and they want to be able to do it in a way that they feel um, legal comfort that they're not going to run into an SEC enforcement action down the road. Yeah, I can definitely see why you know these projects would want clarity, and and you know you you addressed this kind of head on in your comment on uh, the the wireline uh, enforcement decision, where you know it seemed like the concern was uh, you know among you know what is the impact or what is the benefit of the settlements to the uh, investors who you know might might have. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, you were careful, I think, to distinguish some of the, uh, you know, facts and circumstances of that specific case, so as not to excuse, you know, the, the, their, I, I think it was their their failure to to register their offering in the first place. But yeah, you you did look uh, focus very much on 
the fact that you know there was a network build and they did have existing token holders you know who who might have liked to receive those tokens yeah it was a little bit of a, a strange i thought outcome um so this was one where there had been a SAF, but the the argument was that the SAF was not conducted in a way that was consistent with with our offering um, rules. So, so there were section five violations. There were also some, I believe some anti-fraud um, concerns as well that were highlighted. And so um, while I supported the, the action, what, what I thought was a little bit strange was that at the end of the day, the investors were, the, those SAF investors were being told, well, you can't get your tokens. Um, uh, you know, you, the, the distribution can't be done. The, there can be a token, but not the one that that you would actually get and profit from. And I just thought that was a little bit of a strange thing. I mean, we're always in a little difficult position with um, when we come into a situation and we assess it and we try to figure out how can we um, go after the violation and and, you know, bring that to light and also do the best by the by the investors that we're here to protect. Those are often quite difficult issues and 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 very um, you know technical considerations come into play there of how we can <clears throat> how we can ensure that the investors are the are are doing as well as they could be in light of whatever the securities violation um, that happened was. So you know, reasonable minds can differ on what the right approach is, but I was, I, I just thought in that particular case, that wasn't the right approach. I think you're muted. Yes, I'm muted. Re re really rookie mistake after a year of-, of um, I make it all the time. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, I wanna come back to some of these in enforcement things you touched on, but I'd like to also, uh, maybe uh, come back to the, the safe harbor. And I'm kind of two, maybe a little interrelated questions about them. You know, so one, when we, we did another fireside chat a couple of months back, um, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you'd gotten a lot of feedback on the, uh, you know, your original safe harbor proposal and you were gonna be likely to be coming out with a second one. And then in, in December, uh, the SEC came up with this actually commission level uh, safe harbor for broker dealer uh, custody. And so I just wanted to ask, you know, kind of first of all, um, you know, you know, are those two kind of related? Was that a part of your first safe harbor? Uh, and also, when will we be hearing more about kind of the rest of uh, kind of safe harbor 2.0? I think they're related in the sense that it, it it illustrates that we can do these kind of commission level safe harbors, um, and so it would be a model for how we could do something like my safe harbor. Um, that that particular safe harbor really was intended to allow the formation of special purpose broker dealers that deal with digital asset securities. It was quite limited um, in that in that regard because you really have to set up a separate broker dealer that deals with, with digital asset securities. You can't deal with any other kinds of digital assets. Um, and so there's some and it's and it's time limited. So there, there definitely are some concerns from my part on, on how practical it is to use the safe harbor, because, especially because you're not allowed to have any other kinds of digital assets and you do have to you know, have the separation between any kind of regular broker dealer that you're operating. Um, but I'm optimistic about that because I think it allows us to get some feedback um, from the public. I mean, that was part of what we were doing is asking for comment and it gives us something to work with and, and to iterate off of. So I, I think that that was positive. Um, in terms of my own safe harbor, I, I think it would be good to, to give a, a new revised version to um, Chairman Gensler if he is confirmed when he, when he walks in the door, that would be my ideal um, to do that and say, hey, this is something that I've been thinking about and working on and, and really think it's something the commission should spend some time, some time, um, you know, building off of. So that's kind of where things stand now. 2020, there was a lot going on. And so it, I would have liked to get this done earlier, but in some ways I think the timing works out well um, because with a new chairman coming in, we kind of have a new agenda and we can look at things afresh. Um, I don't expect that it's gonna change tremendously from the initial version, but um, 
I'm hoping to, to maybe build in some more protections for the purchasers of the tokens or think about how we can use the technology itself to kind of hardwire some of those protections in. Um, but, you know, certainly still welcome feedback from people. Great, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, feedback and, you know, on both both yours and the, the, the December initiative. And um, yeah, it's something you alluded to in your opening remarks and then uh, kind of a moment ago that the, the December safe harbor for broker dealer custody of digital assets, you know, was procedurally different from most no action letters uh, because it was a commission uh, no action letter and, you know, it, as a commission action, we would take a commission action uh, to uh, to reverse it. Um, you know, was, was that something that, you know, that, that you really pushed for or, you know, how hard was it to sort of build build consensus around doing it at the, the commission level and how much extra time <laughs> did that build into the process to, uh, you know, to be able to get something, um, you know, which gives people more certainty than just a staff no action letter? Well, I almost always like for things to be done at the commission level if possible. I mean, it's not practical for every no action position to be done at, at the commission level. Um, but I do think to the extent that we can do that, it's, it's valuable, not only in this space, but it, it, across the board in what we do. Um, and I think there is a look, I, I can't speak for anyone else at the commission, but I think there's a widespread understanding that there is going to be act activity in this area and we do need to provide some clarity and some guidelines and some parameters around this. So I, I think there that's pretty widespread, uh, a pretty widespread belief. And so from that perspective, I don't think it was too hard to convince um, other commissioners to do something like that. I think there'd be a bigger lift with my, with my safe harbor because it's a bit of a, um, it's a bit of an admission that the Howey test is is difficult, and that um, sometimes the law the the rules are quite blurry, and so that may be a, a little bit more of a step a step further. But I I don't rule it out. I really think that there there is um, you know I think people are are willing to look at this issue with um, with an eye toward allowing the innovation to happen. No, that's so. Uh... Great. Well, we're getting getting a ton of questions already coming in the Q and A. I, I do want to get to a couple more of the ones that we had discussed uh, or developed beforehand, and then uh, we'll, we'll take as many as we we can from the from the Q and A that's coming in. So, um, uh, FinHub, uh, the the SEC's uh, you know in, innovation hub, you know, was recently uh, elevated to uh, you know to an independent office and you know reporting directly to the chairman. Uh, you know, what impact uh, do you think that will um, will have, and you know, do you think it'll be uh, more of a coordinator of policy? Will, do you think it will have any authority to actually uh, act uh, independently of the, the divisions or is it more of a coordinator role? Like, what do you think the impacts will be of this? Well, I think it's good symbolically to have a direct report um, to the chairman. I think it sends a positive message about the importance of the office. Um, of course, any new chairman can come in and change that. So it's it's not guaranteed to be the the way it, it works out under under a, a Gensler chairmanship, for example. Um, and the chairman does have a lot of direct reports. I think this is one thing to emphasize, um, which is that there's there's so much on on a chairman's agenda, and especially a new chairman coming in with mandates um, coming, you know, and directives coming. Uh, uh, from the from the administration's general policy, um, you know, general approach. So so he's going to feel. I mean, we're an independent regulator, but he's going to, of course, feel um, the need to deal with a lot of issues. And so crypto will be one of those issues, I think. Um, but it's certainly going to be one of many. So having this direct report at least is a way to make sure that these issues do get surfaced and brought up to the chairman. And, and the, the office does play, I think it, it will continue to play the role of being a place where people can go from other divisions can go to get expertise and advice about how to move forward on things. I think it can play a coordinating role. It does play that role now, um, bringing people together from across the commission. Um, you know, I, I, it, it's always gonna be a collaborative effort, these issues are, because they do involve TM, IM, CorpFin, 
enforcement sometimes. And so there's always going to be um, a, a collaboration there. Um, I don't think it's going to be making lots of decisions completely just on its own. Um, but but I think it can play a really important role in maybe breaking through some of those silos. Yeah, so, so important in an organization. Um, so something, and I'm guessing there, there may be, you may be quite limited in what you can say about this, but certainly something that made a lot of news at the end of the year was the SEC's enforcement action against Ripple Labs and a number of its, um, you know, a number of its uh, executives. Um, are, are you able to make uh, any any comment about that, or is that really uh, because it's pending litigation uh, off off limits? Yeah, it's off limits because it's pending litigation. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe you know, without commenting specifically on, on that or any other one, can can you maybe help help uh, our, our our viewers understand? You know, what is the role of a commissioner when an enforcement action is brought? So, so for example. You know, is the decision to initiate um, enforcement action, is that something that requires or implies a commission action or, you know, do the commissioners receive, uh, you know, advance notice and have the ability to you know, kind of raise questions before it's brought or, you know, just because the slate of enforcement is so vast, is, is, the, is the commissioner, uh, is a commissioner only involved sort of at the time when a settlement is being considered? Um, so the investigations are launched by the staff without involvement from, from the commissioners. But once there's a decision to either move forward by, to move forward either by suing um, someone or by settling with some, by suing and then settling with someone, um, that's when we get involved and we have a vote um, on on those actions. So they. No suit can be brought, um, no charges can be brought absent um, us signing off on it. And it's, there, there are five commissioners, so it's a majority vote that, that brings about these enforcement actions. And certainly there are lots of questions asked along the way. Um, of course, many enforcement actions, uh, taking, again, taking a step back from crypto and just talking generally, um, many enforcement actions are, are just non-controversial. The violation is quite clear. Um, and that's why you often see um, there'll be a quick settlement too, because often there there just isn't that much dispute. But there are certainly times where there are different views on whether we have the authority to move forward with something, whether um, the approach we're taking is right, whether the settlement um, hits the it, it hits the right balance, um, and and so those kinds of things are are certainly um, topics of, of discussion at the commission level. Sure, and and would, would that play like, for example, sometimes there's decision to bring one, sometimes there's a decision kind of not not to bring one, or, or at least they're in the absence of one, and then, you know, investors can suffer losses, you know, you know, for example, if something, if there are some people who believe something is a security and other people don't, uh, and you know, then it's you know offered for trading on platforms. Um, you know, people who, people, you know, how to kind of issues like that, um, where you know maybe taking an action earlier, uh, it, you know, could could prevent investor losses, but it you know also it could you know, maybe balancing you know kind of innovation with with consumer protection. Maybe it's better to wait. You know, how how do those you know, how do you weigh or balance those types of considerations? Well, so a lot of those kinds of things, I mean, I think you, you raise an important point, which is that a decision not to bring a case um, might actually come from the staff level because they will make a recommendation to us and we act on the recommendation. So if no recommendation is made, then that means that we're not, we're not going to act. Um, that said, I think the staff is, is, you know, they, they try to, to be pretty careful. And that's why some of these, these enforcement actions can take some time. There's a lot of investigation involved. There's a lot of legwork involved before it gets to us as the commission. Um, but I, one thing that, that Chairman Clayton tried to achieve, and I think other chairmen have also tried to achieve this, and I'm sure this will be something that's important for, for Chair Gensler as well if he gets, if he gets confirmed, um, is the notion that you really do want to bring enforcement actions as quickly as you can to address the violation as quickly as you can, 
um, that's good for not only for the particular situation that you're dealing with, but it's it's good for deterrence as well, so that people know, yeah, you're going to face consequences for violating the securities laws, and you're going to face them quickly. Um, but the agency is working on lots of different things. The enforcement division, uh, you know, one one sad thing about being a commissioner is that you do see the depravity of of people and the willingness of people to. Um, engage in securities violations. So there are a lot of things that we can br be bringing actions on and it's, it's, um, it can be difficult to figure out how to allocate your resources. You know, you know, without a doubt. So we've got a couple of questions about kind of types of information or feedback that would be useful. Um, that they're kind of interrelated. One of them is asking about, are there kind of particular questions uh, that industry or other groups could answer to help you uh, kind of develop improvements or enhancements to Safe Harbor or you know, Safe Harbor 2.0. And then also a, a question with regard to the, um, the, the specific uh, broker dealer custody uh, commission no action letter. Uh, again, are there, you know, I'd say quite a number of questions were posed uh, for comment in there, but are there particular things that would be of um, that you think are the most important for the industry to engage with the, the SEC or, or yourself to help develop the thinking on these? So in terms of the safe harbor, what would be helpful is just any advice that you have to make it workable in you know, real life for the real projects that you're trying to develop. So are, are there things that, that you see in there that you say, no, 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 this just doesn't make sense in light of what's actually going on in the world? Or um, if, if you, can think of a way that we can we can harness the technology itself to provide more customer protection than you would get with traditional technologies. That would be very helpful for for me. Um, you all know the technology a lot better than I do, so that would be quite helpful. Um, if if there are other kinds of safe harbors that you think would be helpful, that also would be good for me to know. Um, I'm you know I think that this is is something that as DeFi, for example, moves forward, as, as other develop, as institutions get more interested in this area, are there other places that you think we could think about some kind of a safe harbor approach? Um, or, you know, if there are rules that you think we should be adopting, that would be helpful too. With respect to the December safe harbor, um, I would say, you know, one, for me, most important is tell us what it would take to make it really workable for you. Um, tell us what, what we, you know, we put in some conditions. I guess I would also like to know, are those conditions meaningful? Do they, do they work with what you're doing? Do they make sense? Um, and then I think more broadly, it would be helpful for you to help us think through issues like SIPC coverage. If there were to be, if if you were to be able to, to just put this in a regular broker dealer, how does SIPC coverage apply to digital assets, um, including digital assets that are not securities? Those kinds of issues would be helpful for people to think through with me. Yeah, no, those yeah, the specific issues. I mean, something that's that's very apparent from you know the July 2019 SEC Finra staff statement, you know, kind of comments. Uh, you know, um, Deputy Director Baird has has has, has made. Um, you know, the recent thing is that there's a lot of concerns about uh, you know, first of all, investors not understanding whether their um, securities are protected by SIPC or not protected by SIPC, and you know whether. That that's there, and and then I suppose there's these potential issues of you know contagion of sort of these irrecoverable you know non-security digital assets being lost. But it it does seem you know it does seem like there are you know other broker dealers that have been you know dealing with kind of non quote crypto or non digital asset uh, security you know private private securities that also are not protected by SIPC. Um, and somehow that that regime, you know, has been manageable, you know, over a number of years without necessarily kind of creating kind of digital non digital. Um, you know, do you think that there are learnings from um, kind of that private placement, um, you know, regime that could be applied here to to help, you know, deal with some of these new challenges of, of digital assets. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. Sometimes we think about this stuff as, as if there's no analog in the analog world, uh, but but actually there might well be. And so so I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So um, now I would I would uh, be remiss also if if uh, we we didn't spend a moment or two on on GameStop and you know how it's added you know kind of game stonk to our and you know our you know these these areas never cease enriching our vocabularies. Um, but you know have you um, you know what has sort of struck you about that about you know kind of obviously the the attention uh, the, the the new levels of engagement of, of retail in investors. You know, do you see some silver linings in, in this, or how how are you thinking about this whole saga so far? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I should say it's a it, it's it's a multi layered issue, and there are lots of things that we're looking at um, in in the wake of of the the market activity, the retail involvement, the activities of broker dealers, um, issues around short selling issues around payment for order flow. There are lots of issues that have that have kind of bubbled to the surface because of this event. Um, and you know, one thing that I, I would say for, from the silver lining perspective is I do think it's good for a new generation of investors to be interested in the markets and not interested only in, in investing through um, the more traditional vehicles like, like um, you know, index funds. I think that for many investors and probably for most investors, that's going to be the way they interact with the markets. That's going to be the way they build their retirement nest eggs. And, and so certainly not trying to take anything away from that. But I don't think it's the bad thing for people to want to be more involved in stock picking, in, in, in analysis. Um, you know, so so that can be a positive thing. It can be a way to bring more uh, more information into the market. You have younger investors who are actually ones who, um, you know, maybe interacted with GameStop as customers, and so they have a different perspective than other people have. That said, I think when anything like this happens, when there's a run up in prices of anything, the the a immediate reaction of a securities regulator is to say, please be careful because there's going to be someone standing there with the bag at the end of the day who's going to lose a lot of money. And so that also is always going to be part of our, our message. Um, that said, I think a lot of people who were involved likely knew exactly the risk that they could lose money. In fact, there's some very public statements of people saying you know, I think this is this has been a really fun and interesting ride, even though I lost money. So, you know, look, people are all different and people get their their thrills in different ways. But I do think people need to always be careful. They need to always be thinking about, um, you know, am I putting my last dollar in there or can I afford to lose that dollar? Um, and if not, they, they, they should be careful. But I, I, I hope that we can take a positive from this, which is that there is room for retail investors to participate in our markets. Our markets are not just for institutional investors. And, um, you know, if, if we want people to buy into the securities markets, we have to let them participate in those markets. Um, otherwise, there's going to be this view that there's a group of people who can make money in the securities markets and everyone has to, else has to stay out or, or, or just um, hire someone who's, who's one of those people to work for them. But even there, we have these accredited investor rules that, you know, put up these arbitrary boundaries between the, the, the haves and have nots. So that's how a lot of people perceive this. And I think we have to be very careful to guard our capital markets and to, to send the message that this is for everyone. It's for everyone to participate on the side of getting capital and also contributing to cap, capital. And, and everyone in society should be benefiting from the capital markets. If not, there's no point for them to, to exist. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, that's a strong statement, but I think the point is that the capital markets are a treasure of the, of the country and they're for the overall welfare and benefit of, of, of our nation. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. And, and, you know, the, the um, couple of things you mentioned there, I mean, the kind of the democratization or broader broadening of the access to, to these retail investors, you know, I think that, you know, looking at 
GameStop, you know, it, it is kind of a, a cousin, uh, at least of, you know, what's happened in the, you know, kind of crypto or digital assets world where there's obviously much, much broader, uh, you know, broadening of access uh, of, of, of those. And, and, you know, you also mentioned the uh, definition of accredited investor and, you know, there, there was kind of new, new rule last year that, you know, started to broaden the definition of an accredited investor. I think that the initial designations have involved people who've uh, passed certain uh, exams administered by, by FINRA. Um, but, you know, is, is this a, a promising area, you know, for, you know, maybe, I don't know whether it's, well, I was, I'm a GameStop customer, so that allows me to invest. Maybe that's not necessarily the best idea, but, you know, some of these, you know, retail investors, um, you know, may be very tech savvy. Uh, you know, is, are there, do you see other categories or opportunities to broaden democracy of access by, uh, by focusing further on the accredited investor definition? Well, I, of course, would like to, to, to really broaden access to allow people to make their own choices to make sure that it's very clear if you're getting the protections of, of the public markets or not, um, but then to allow people to decide how to spend their hard-earned money. But I'm also a realist, and I think that we're not going to open the doors. So, I, so one positive from what we did, which was quite limited in terms of actually expanding the accredited investor category, was to say we now don't see that there's there's this link that necessarily wealth and income are the only ways to determine sophistication, um, but there might be other ways. And so, if you're someone who is a, a retail investor who spends her nights and weekends studying um, the markets, uh, there should be some way for you to show that you are you are ready to be an accredited investor, that you're ready to participate in these markets. And so tests or, you know, maybe it's someone who, who's taken classes um, on investing at, at a college um, level, you know, maybe something like that could be something that we look at. Um, other kinds of credentials should, should maybe qualify you to be an accredited investor. So I think there's a lot of room for thinking on that point. I don't know how um, how much traction that will get in the in the coming years here at the SEC, but I think given that you know we're all trying to recover from the COVID um, hit to the economy and and the COVID hit specifically to small businesses, there will be some interest in looking for ways for people in communities who have seen so many small businesses fail are able to contribute to the rebuilding of those small businesses. And maybe that leads to a, to a more, more openness to more creative thinking on an accredited investor. That's interesting. I, I suppose other channels like crowdfunding or, or Reg A Plus could be you know, available as well in that. Yeah, and we've made some changes on those, on, on those scores and I think those can be valuable. I mean, Many companies are not ready for maybe a Reg A plus, but they might be able to use crowdfunding. I think we can still probably do some more tweaking on crowdfunding to make it more useful. We could develop a micro offering exemption. Um, there, those are some of the things I'm thinking about. But, but I think we're we're going to have to confront the fact that a lot of really small businesses need capital. Sure, sure. So shifting gears, uh, it's an interesting question from really small companies to very large public companies. Uh, quite a number of public companies uh, are buying uh, Bitcoin as, uh, on, on, that they have on their uh, balance sheet. Uh, you know, do you have any kind of perspective on, on this trend? And you know, at some point, uh, you know, is there a, a risk that they actually themselves become investment companies or, or ETFs if, if they reach some uh, tipping point there? Well, that is something that companies need to think about. I think most of the companies that I've seen doing it so far are, are uh, limiting it to quite a small fraction of their balance sheet. But it's an interesting it's an interesting trend to see. I don't know. Um, you know, I think from from my perspective, it, the companies can make whatever decisions about what they want to have on their balance sheet as long as they're you know operating consistent with, as you say, they have to think about the Investment Company Act. 
But from my perspective, it is a real wake up call for us at the SEC, because some people are seeing these companies and they, they are saying, well, this is a way for us to get exposure to Bitcoin, even though it's a small percentage of their balance sheet. So it's a little bit of a wake up call to say, OK, we we really need to provide people another way to get access to um, to Bitcoin and, and, and probably at the end of the day, ETH as well. Yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does feel like, you know, that, I mean, there's been talk for years about, you know, was 2018 going to be the years the the year the institutionals came in? Was 2019 going to be it? Was 2020 going to be? But, you know, it seems like there's kind of more indicia. Um, so so we've gotten a couple of... Oh, it has surprised even, even people who, have, who are engaged in this space. I think that the Bitcoin on balance sheet trend has really been quite a surprise to lots of people. Yes, yes, and certainly gathered a lot of uh, attention, and you know, turned into obviously a number of these CEOs into uh, evangelists um, to to a degree. So we've gotten a couple of questions, um, a number of questions about the role of the the SEC. You know, what one of them, um, you know, is that there's there's not really any federal regulator who supervises the um, the, the spot market for crypto assets. Uh, I mean, obviously the the CFTC has kind of indirect and enforcement and other uh, you know, authority, if there's fraud or manipulation that affects the ones that are not considered securities, you know, the SEC would obviously oversee any, uh, you know, crypto asset that is considered a, a security once any such determination is made. Um, so, you know, it, it, you know, would take congressional action to designate, um, you know, a federal regulator to oversee kind of the markets for, you know, for crypto assets more broadly, uh, the spot markets, you know, is, is that something that, you um, you know, seems to you like would, would be, a, you know, a good idea or maybe something that would help promote the, the market structure. If, you know, obviously if Congress were to do that, maybe the SEC would need to ask for that um, authority. But is that something you've considered? And, you know, do you think that there would be benefits to that? You know, I, I think that, that that's not really what's necessary in this area. You're seeing these spot markets develop that are developing their own pretty sophisticated um, rules. They've learned a lot from from equity trading and other kinds of trading venues, and they're developing they're developing rules that that um, work for the for that space. So that's not where I would put the emphasis. I think if Congress is going going to get involved, you know, there might be some thought about providing more clarity about clarity about who has jurisdiction over what, or you know, if if the White House were going to get involved in, in trying to play a coordinating role across um, agencies. That's something that I, I was li just listening to uh, former CFTC Chairman John Carlo talk about. And I think that there is there is room for some kind of a um, more coordinated role. Treasury plays that role to some degree, but I think that um, that's something that we could think about. And, and working on maybe cross-agency sandboxes of some sort so that it's someone who does have something that that they're trying to build and they don't know who to go to they could go to the central point and kind of it would be a a cross-agency effort um that might be something as well yeah interesting so so if, you know there could be benefits to congress or the white house you know paying attention to bring greater kind of coordination or clarity but that that would not be number one on your uh, wish list well, I guess I could, you know, look, there have been some great suggestion, suggested and proposed um, approaches coming from members of Congress who really care about this area. So I'm certainly not trying to, to, to diminish what they're trying to do. And, and if they did provide us directives, it could be helpful to us at the SEC. Um, and, you know, they've, they've been thinking about frameworks for um, approaching this question of security or non-security. And so I think some of that kind of clarity could be helpful for us as well. So um, certainly not trying to trying to uh, diminish the efforts of, of those in Congress who, who really care about this. And, and, you know, to your earlier point, I think these are bipartisan efforts um, with concern coming from both sides of the aisle about the need to provide more clarity. Sure. So we've gotten a number of questions about uh, DeFi, some of which I think would be take way more time than, than we have remaining, such as how do you define it? Um, but uh, <laughs> although if, if, if uh, you know, it seems to be a number of things under that. Well, 
See, I think DeFi, the way I think about it is it is the counterpoint to CeFi, right? It's the way to build peer-to-peer -peer, um, networks that enable people to, to, to engage in all manner of financial transactions without an intermediary that you would normally have. Um, and I think the, the best thing I've read recently on it was the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis just put out a paper on DeFi, um, which is quite helpful in kind of giving the taxonomy of what DeFi is and what it looks like now. But as we talked about earlier, it's, a, it's something that's growing and changing fast. And I think um, a lot of what was done in traditional finance is, is being replicated with crypto in the DeFi space. So you've got lending, um, you've got asset management, you've got a whole range of, um, you know, you've got exchanges, exchanges of, of different crypto. Um, and, and so that's the whole range of things. And, and to some extent, I think of DeFi as being the first effort and and then we're going to go from there to decentralized autonomous organizations where you really are building company-like structures but doing it on a decentralized basis and do you see that as a um you know an, an innovation that will strengthen u.s markets do you see it as a threat um I, th I think it's it's always good to find new ways for people to work together and interact with one another and, and um, build things together. So I, I think that that's actually a, you know, it's, it's a way to harness human creativity and harness human talent. So, you know, there certainly are going to be questions for lawyers coming out of this and, and, and how this works. Wyoming is a bit ahead of the curve in terms of thinking about a structure actually that would allow for DAOs. Um, but I think the rest of us are all going to have to to think about how we regulate them and 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 how you know if there's a problem how how does that problem get resolved? So there are certainly um, many issues, but it there there's some promising um, you know some promising things I, I expect to come out of this. Sure, sure, uh, it's that fascinating, and yeah, I think all sorts of issues for for. For, for business people, for certainly for regulators who are used to regulating, you know, entities located in their jurisdiction and, and how to, you know, a lot to grapple with there. Um, I think I, we still have a lot of questions to get to, but, you know, we only have time, I think, for, um, for, for maybe I'm going to combine two of them. Uh, you already mentioned Wyoming. Um, you know, how does the SEC work with uh, with with state with states on 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 these on some of these uh, emerging issues? And also, is there a foreign jurisdiction that you think is 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 dealing with a kind of digital or crypto assets very well, or potentially better than the U.S. is right now? Yeah, I mean, I think to the last question, I think Singapore is a good example of of um, a jurisdiction that's that's taking a, a wise approach. Um, again, I'm, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not so familiar with it that I sign off on everything they've done, but from what I see as an outsider, it, it seems like a good approach. Um, look, I think we have, we have a lot to learn from the states. I think we can work better with the states. Um, but, you know, with respect to Wyoming, we recently, they issued a no action letter about what a qualified custo custodian, um, was they they said one of their entities was a qualified custodian using a no action letter. Um, we stepped in and said, wait a minute, you know, we get to decide what's a qualified custodian under the Advisors Act. But I do think what they did there was a way for to kind of get us to think about what that means in 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 our space. And so I think it was a helpful push for us. I think we've been nudged forward by the states in a helpful way. And I would say for people. Um, who do have other questions for me, don't hesitate to reach out, commis Commissioner Purse at sec.gov. Um, always happy to, to hear from you. That's fantastic. Well, on, on that note, Commissioner Purse, we're, we're really uh, you know, absolutely grateful. You've been very uh, generous with your time and your views. Uh, ho hopefully we can do it again uh, later, later this year, but obviously it's gonna be a very, very busy year. For you, it already has been. And again, we're, we're very grateful for your insights and your time. Thank you uh, very, very much. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate it.